Pax et bonu, my dear brothers and sisters. Peace and all good to you all. I thank Father Paul Chong for inviting me to journey with you for nine days. I'm not sure whether you'll be grateful to him for doing that. I just might be your cross to carry for nine days. However, this is two things. First, a novena for nine days. Um, and we usually do novenas to honor someone. In this case, your domiciliar patron, St. Francis, seraphic father of the Franciscan order, of which the Capuchins are part. We also offer a novena when we seek something. And the novena becomes an expression of our desire for that which we pray for. And that's why uh, it is customary that in the novena masses, the people who undergo the novena make time, effort, and sacrifice to attend those masses, no matter if they might constitute repeated liturgies or they might come at the most odd moments or odd times because it is an indication of their desire for that which we hope to receive uh, in, ex in exchange for the prayers of the patron. Okay. And because the novena is understood to, as, as a unit composed of nine days, there is usually a theme. And it has been given to me that the theme, theme not that, that's for today, but is listening to creation. And it was providential that the readings for today touch on a very important dimension of our, it's okay, he said sorry, an important dimension of our theme. And we say we're listening to creation. We have first tried to understand what is listening. And you might be saying, oh, that's the most ordinary thing. Listening is not even a complicated word. I neglected to ask what it would be in Bahasa, but uh, I will share something with you in Filipino later about listening. Listening is important, especially when we go to the sources of Scripture. Because in the old language, uh, listening takes on a different sense. Okay? So, and we, that's the core theme. That's the core of our theme. We have to listen apparently to creation. But first, let's understand what do we mean by listening? Now, there. You know, the New Testament was written in a language called Koine Greek. And when listening is translated into English, when, 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 when we hear the word listening in sacred scripture, uh, it's usually in the New Testament translated as a form of the root word akuo. And akuo, well, literally is to listen, but it refers to three things. First, it can be one's ability to hear. So you are listening because you are able to hear something. You are not deaf. You, know, you are not in need of a hearing aid. So that's one way to understand listening. One listens because one is able to use one's ear. But to listen is to also listen attentively. All right? It is now also an activity. You sit really trying to hear. Now, uh, the good, uh, happy sacristan adjusted the mic. And I presume it must have been very far from my voice earlier. I could hear myself, but apparently maybe it was not you know, loud enough for you. And so some of you would have to try, you would have tried your best to listen. Ah, what is he saying? And so now you're not just using your ears, you're trying to focus your ears. You're trying to be attentive to get each and every nugget of sound that comes from the speaker. That's one way to understand listening as well. That's another sense of aquo. But there is an important dimension in aquo, which is the responsibility to comprehend and understand what you hear. It becomes now a duty. Now, and in Filipino, I am sorry, I forgot to ask in Bahasa. Ah, I, it occurred to me just now. 
In Tagalog, we have two words similar to that. And it's different only by one letter. It's dinig. Uh, it's dinig is to hear. Diba? Uh, dingin mo, to hear. Uh, um, and usually it's uh, another form of rinig. Marinig. Marinig is usually to hear. Dingin is to heed. It's one thing to hear, it's another thing to heed. And one heeds what one hears only when one comprehends what has been told. To the parents here, you probably have this problem with your children. You said something already, they didn't, they seem to hear, enter here, get out the other. Or they say yes, but they don't do it well enough. But this is not just a problem for children. This can be a problem for the faithful. Now in that, the New Testament, when we go to the Old Testament, one of the most important words related to listening is the Hebrew Shema. And Shema is actually comes from Deuteronomy, and that's a core religious tenet of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. The Lord is your God. And so, in Hebrew, Shema is also uh, related more theologically to God speaking. We don't just hear someone talk. To listen is to listen to God who reveals himself. We don't just listen because it's some word that floats in the air. We ought to listen to God. And God is not somebody who's sitting in the cloud expecting you to, you know, discover his will. Oh, I'm going to keep quiet. I'm just going to give clues. Uh, let's see if you're going to discover. It's not like a quiz. He says what he wants to say. He actually gives commandments from his own own fingerprints. He speaks through prophets. What God, uh, what, uh, what country is there that has its God so close as us? The Israelites would say. For he actively journeys with us, talks to us, reveals himself to us. And because of this, Israel discovers its identity. They Oh, it, it jumped. <laughs> it discovers its identity because Israel knows we are the people that listen to God. We are the people to whom God has revealed himself and therefore we are the people called to listen to him and this now enters into a relationship. Listening is not transactional. Listening is not just to if you're a student, to listen to your teacher so that you have something to answer in the exam. Listening begins a relationship where you don't just do what you hear. You start to understand the personality of the speaker. And in as much as you get to know the other by listening, the other gets to know who you are by how you listen, by how you heed. And so the relationship becomes one of, number one for Israel, allegiance. If you are truly my people, then you have to listen to me. And every time Israel closes its ears, they fall into ruin. And that's why always, almost always, the prophets will say, Hear, O Israel! Whenever they will shake Israel into, into wakefulness, they would always say, listen to God speaking. I'll uh, go and uh, take a quick uh, uh, side, side trip. Recently in the Philippines, there was, we just had elections. And it was very, very uh, 
telling because many priests started to speak about what their faith meant for the election ballot in the Philippines. Huh? This is in the Philippines. But, oh, it seems not many Filipinos listen. So some were saying, oh, the church is powerless. No one listens to them. This is an embarrassment. But someone I know brought me to a different perspective. He says, there is no embarrassment if the people do not heed the voice of prophets. Shame not on the prophets, but on those who have closed their ears. And so, the listening relationship requires not just allegiance, but it actually really questions, do you identify with the voice? If you listen, it means you reaffirm your fidelity with the one who speaks. And therefore, when we talk about listening, hearing, how does God normally speak? He speaks in four, normally in four dimensions in our lives. First, it's in sacred scripture and tradition. We just listen to him speak in the gospel and in the readings, and we will return to that shortly. But he, would always, he had already revealed his will in scripture and in how the world and how the church has grown and listened to his voice over time. He continues to speak to us in magisterium. As Catholics, you know, when we talk about the Word of God, we don't talk about Scripture. That's a very Protestant idea. The Word of God for a Catholic has three sources. One is sacred Scripture, another is sacred tradition, and the third source for the Word of God, meaning how God speaks to us, is magisterium. When the church says, this is Catholic teaching, this is Catholic truth. This is the meaning of Christianity. That is God speaking. And the church says, abortion is a fundamental evil. That is the word of God. When it says, marriage can never be broken in divorce, that's the word of God. When it says that this or that needs to be done as an expression of our fidelity, that's the word of God. And it beckons on us to allow ourselves to be taught. Magisterium is not a matter of democracy. It's also a matter of the church continuously reflecting on sacred scripture and tradition and listening to God speak to us in this modern age. And when it hears clearly the voice of God, it speaks it in magisterio. We, ordinary faithful, can listen also to the word of God by discerning the signs of the time. And this is where it is important for us to understand our experiences. We don't just live lives as if, well, we're just flowing or going with the flow. We have to actively live our lives. We have to be in a continuous pursuit of meaning. What does my experience tell me? Where is the world going? Where is the voice of God in my life? How am I called by my Lord to engage the world around me? How do I bring my Christianity to affect my life in the office, at home, in the ballot box? It means we are called to bring our Christianity outside the church to make our Christianity a fragrant influence for the good in the world. In order to do that, we have to be attentive to the signs of the times. And this we do in prayer. 
This we normally do if we listen to our consciences. And this we do if we allow ourselves to be guided in our spiritual lives. We are not merely Christians because we go to Mass. We are Christians because when we go to Mass, we allow the Eucharist to transform our lives. We are Christians because when we go to Mass and receive the communion, we are telling the Lord, in the same way you are broken in the bread, I will be willing to be broken for someone else. In the same way you are broken in the Eucharist, and I receive you in the Eucharist, I am willing to obey my mother when she says, oh, don't go out with your friends. Right? I am willing to be broken for my wife. When she says, go home early, don't go with your office mates partying. I don't trust your office mate. Huh? And even if you say, there's nothing between us, why don't you trust me? You just keep quiet. I will just go and obey my wife or obey my husband. I will trust him. If he says there's nothing between him and that woman, then I will trust him. I will allow myself to be broken. And in as much as God has loved me by offering his life for me, then I shall offer my life for others. I shall think less and less of myself and more and more of others. That is how we allow ourselves to listen in prayer and in conscience. And letting religious practice become spiritual truth in our lives. Allow me to end this, my dear brothers and sisters, by two recommendations regarding how to more actively listen. And we hear this in what was proclaimed in the responsorial psalm. Often, the responsorial psalm is ignored. But in this day, it is providential that the responsorial psalm is at the center. It's a beautiful bridge between the first reading and the gospel. In, the first, in, in a few verses, in the first half of our responsorial psalm, we are called to lives of faith. And when we talk about faith, my dear brothers and sisters, we are called to, have, to trust the Lord. Look at two verses in what you just, we just sung and responded to. In one, it says, It is good that I was afflicted because I now learned the, le the lessons of the Lord. Sometimes, uh, I don't know whether they spank children now, but, you know, to some of you who have been uh, ripe in years, you must have had parents who, when you, are, uh, when you have uh, done something wrong, would have been hit at the buttocks by a palm or a stick. Mm. And, and sometimes you might have complained, my mother doesn't love me, or my mother is too strict. But eventually you learn, ah, he was right. She was right. They some, and in school, even now, I used to be working in a school. I say, we make things difficult for students. Why? Not because we hate them, but because they need to build intellectual muscle. How will they learn to read long essays and books in college if we don't make them read long things while they're in high school? How do they learn to juggle different professors if we do not get them to taste difficult teachers who expect them to send homework every other day? <laughs> it is not because we're cruel. It is because sometimes afflictions teach us to become strong. And we trust and have faith in the Lord because His will is just. He is always just. And that is why when we enter into affliction, we rely on God that He will get us out at the right time. This is what Job almost forgot in the first reading. 
Eventually, Job was doing it right. He was getting all sorts of tests. And always he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now he had three friends who tried to tell him, Oi, 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 you must have a sin. No, no, I don't have anything. I didn't do anything wrong. Ay, nako, you're blind. You must have done something. You, that this will not have happened to you if you did not do anything wrong. And so it was the friends who was trying to tell Job, you must have done something wrong. And in frustration, the, Job says, I give up. Why is this happening to me? I know I've not done anything wrong. But why, Lord? Why the affliction? Did the Lord answer? No. All the Lord said was, Shh! Can you count the sand in the sea? Have you seen where the sun rises and goes down? Do you know the, the home of the light? If you do, you come here and you become God. And Job realizes, I have to let God have his way. I have to allow God to be God in my life. God is not God because he obeys my will. I have to let God speak to me. And if he says, just trust me, I have to trust him. And so in the first reading, he repents. I'm sorry, Lord. I forgot. I just have to trust and have faith. In the second half, we hear that that's why we have to humble ourselves. We are servants. And we need to discern in order to know God's will. God always reveals himself. He sheds light and he gives understanding to those who allow themselves to listen. This is what the Lord repeats in the gospel. Blessed are you, Father, for you have hidden this from the learned, but revealed it to the simple. And what is the simple? To those who merely trust. So in order to be able to listen to anything, creation, but especially God speaking in our lives, we first have to allow God to be God and we have to humble ourselves before Him. Because only by accepting with peace whatever is before us can the truth of what it means reveal itself. At the end of the day, this is a call, my dear brothers and sisters, to love. Because, you know, you only truly listen to the one you love. If you want to know who you love, find out who you are willing to listen to at any time. Look at lovers. When they text one time, are you awake? Ah. <laughs> uh. Some, they send a message on Discord or on, on Messenger. Uh, are you still up? If they immediately respond, mm, you love them. They're important. But if you're seen zoned, it's seen, but there's no response. Mm, it hurts because you feel, am I really important? Why doesn't he make time to respond? Right? The one you're quickly able to listen to. You're the one you're ready to give time to. That's the one you love. So it's a good time for us, my dear brothers and sisters, to ask ourselves in this first day of your parish recollection, in whom or in what are you ready to listen? Which thing in your life or which person in your life do you, always has a ready attention or can command your quick and ready attention? And then in the other people in your life, do you really openly listen to them? Or do you have an attitude that you expect that whatever they say, you're more interested in saying what you have to say rather than first listening to what they have to say? 
I ask this because in order for us to start listening to God and to creation, we have to understand where our heart is and what our attitudes are when it comes to relationships. And listening is a good indicator as to where our heart is oriented. May this Eucharist, the first day of our novena, help us to renew and reorient our hearts so that it seeks to listen to God's will before our own. Amen.